fourth lesson in introduction to Euclid. We will begin by talking about the structure of the universe. The light and dark are not the same as the light and dark of the sun. The light and the dark are the same as the light and the dark of the sun. The two points in the sky are the same as the light and the dark of the sun. The light and dark are the same as the light and the dark of the sun. The molecular light and dark are the same as the light and the dark of the sun. This is the the type 3 survivorship. So again, if I compare birds, humans, and trees, what I find is that very different mortality rates at different points in their life uh, in their lifespan. All right, so so far what we've talked about for the most part is variation in life history between different species, between birds and humans in terms of survivorship, between elk and mergansers in terms of the number of offspring they have. You can actually have variation in life histories within species as well. And so let's take a look at a good example with humans. So we have Jennifer Aniston here with no children. Uh, and again, remember that the number of offspring you have is a life history trait. We also have the Duggars over there with, I'm not even sure how many children, I think it's 19. Um, so again, these are both humans, both the same species, we think. Um, and yet they have very, very different life history traits, or very different life histories. However, even accounting for variation within a species, we frequently see that the differences we see between two species are much greater than the differences we see within a species. So zero offspring and 19 offspring may seem like a huge difference, but then if I compare that to some spiders that lay up to a thousand eggs with a thousand offspring, I suddenly think the difference between zero and 19 is kind of small. Um, so even the Duggars can't compare with spiders. And so again, your differences between species are often larger in terms of life history, history traits than your differences within a species. Not always, but typically. So if I sort of look at a, a whole pile of different life history traits and I put them together to make this whole story about an organism's life and how that organism lives its life, I call that a life history strategy. So the life history strategy is the overall pattern in the timing and nature of life history events 
things like breeding and dying. Um, and we take all those events and we average the sort of ways that all the individuals live their lives in a particular species and that gives us a sort of general trend in how on average that species lives its life and that's what we call the life history strategy. So a good example is with ticks. With ticks we uh, they start as eggs and once the eggs hatch we have three different life stages. We have a six-legged larval life stage, we have an eight-legged nymph life stage, and then we have an adult life stage. And what you'll notice is that the different life stages tend to appear at different times in the year. Uh, and so we have larvae that are typically hatching somewhere around the summer, uh, and then they mature into nymphs someplace around the next spring, and then the nymphs become adults sometime the fall after that, and then those adults lay eggs. And so, again, that's sort of the tick life history. And what you'll also notice is that um, at different life stages, the ticks eat different organisms. They feed on different types of animals. So larval ticks don't tend to feed on humans as much. They might, but they don't tend to feed on humans as much. They instead feed on mice and birds. Um, nymphal ticks start to feed on humans and deer, but they still also feed on small mammals. By the time you get to adult ticks, they're typically targeting larger mammals. Again, that's a generalization, not always true, but that's sort of um, the story of how ticks live their life. When the different stages are present, what the different stages are, what the different stages are eating, when these organisms are reproducing. Um, and so in terms of speaking of reproduction, adult females lay about 2,000 eggs in a single egg mass, possibly even worse than spiders. Um, and they typically do that in the fall. So again, that's a little bit about reproduction, and that's the that's a part of the life history strategy of a tick. So life history strategies or life history traits can be governed by a variety of different factors. One of the most common is by genes and genotypes. And I think I love is fire ant colony organization. I know you all know what fire ants are. I'm pretty sure most of you have never heard of fire ant colony organization. This is actually determined by what's known as the GP9 gene. And so with fire ants, we can have two different forms. We can have a monogynous form and we can have a polygynous form. And in the monogynous form, there's one queen per colony. And these colonies tend to reproduce by using mating flights. So they send out males, they send out females, they mate and the females then establish a new colony. And these colonies tend to be a little bit smaller. It may not sound small, but it's actually smaller. There's about 18 million workers per hectare. And we know that being monogynous in these fire ants is controlled by uh, the GP9 gene, and it has to be homozygous for the biggie, big B, big B allele. So the queen in these populations has to have a big B, big B allele. You contrast that to the polygynous life history trait, and in these colonies we have several queens per colony, not just one. And these colonies don't actually tend to have a lot of mating flights. Occasionally they do, but not often. Mostly these colonies reproduce by just budding off, by sending one of their many queens out into the world to start a new sort of empire. Um, the polygynous colonies, which are actually quite common um, in South Carolina, they tend to have many more workers per hectare, so about 35 million workers per hectare. And we know that polygynous colonies, um, at the GP9 gene, the queens have a big B, little b, so they're heterozygous. And so again, this is where two different life uh, history traits are determined by what particular gene the queen in the colony has. So that may make you wonder, well, why, why do we have these? Two different genes? Why are they both present? What's going on? Why do we see these two different life history traits in this particular species? Um, and of course because these life history traits are governed by genes it makes sense that we have selection going on and um, these organisms have sort of evolved one strategy or another. And if both strategies are present it tends to probably mean that both strategies are good in their own way. And so studies have shown that the polygynous um, heterozygote big B little b colonies are actually better at finding and competing for food. And that's just because there's so many more workers out there. Remember, it's 35 million per hectare instead of 18 million per hectare, so they're just getting more. Um, and so in that sense, they're actually better at harvesting food and using that to grow the colony really big and getting to those higher densities. So that's their strength, and that's why they exist and why they do well and why they continue to be present.
the monogynous colonies have a different advantage. So one of the problems with the polygynous colonies is that when they reproduce, sometimes they end up with little b, little b homozygous queens, and those die. And so basically they lose about 25% of their new queens because of this fatal little b, little b genotype. And so that means they're worse at reproduction, whereas the big b, big b monogynous colonies, they may not be good at harvesting food and growing quite so much. They may not be as good at colony growth. But they're better at reproduction because they're not losing 25% of their new queens to this fatal gene combination. So here we see a trade-off between growth of the colony, which is good in the which the heterozygote colonies with the big B little B are good at, and reproduction of the colony, which the homozygote big B big B colonies are good at. And so this actually allows the polygynous and monogynous colonies to coexist. It allows you to have these two different life history strategies with the same species because each life history strategy has its own advantage, its own benefit. Right. So that is genetic control of life history traits. And of course, anytime something is genetically controlled, anytime that it can be passed from parent to offspring, it can be selectable. Um, and so we can have that evolve. We also have life history traits that are governed by environment rather than genetics. So two organisms may have identical genes, but they actually live different lives because of where they are. Um, a good example of this, also in insects, is the desert locust. And so desert locusts, even with the same identical genotypes, can exist in two different color forms depending on whether they um, sort of uh, began their early life or were reared under solitary conditions or whether they were reared in really crowded, you know, high population density conditions. Um, so these solitary locusts live on a very narrow range of plants and they don't eat each other, they're not cannibalistic. On the other hand, these gregarious uh, life forms, they actually eat almost anything. If it's, if it's a plant, they'll eat it. Um, and they'll actually even stretch beyond plants from being vegetarians, they'll actually eat each other. So they're cannibalistic. Very different life histories in terms of what they eat, in terms of their coloration, in terms of a lot of things. But they can have identical genotypes. It's not that you can take that exact same cricket and raise it in two different conditions, and it lives an entirely different life. So when this happens, we call it phenotypic plasticity. Remember, phenotype refers to what the organism looks like or sort of the, how the trait is expressed. And so that's why we see these differences. We see these very visible differences. And plasticity means that, um, like a plastic, it can kind of bend and be melded into one form or another. Um, and so that's the idea, the sort of, there's this um, ability to change forms depending on where you find yourself that's independent of your genes. Uh, and so um, these differences in life history, um, even when they're phenotypically, uh, even when they're environmentally controlled, they actually often lead to very different appearances of the organisms. And so again, we see this in the desert locust, we see camouflage coloration in the solitary locusts. We see what we know as uh, what we call a posmatic coloration in the gregarious crowded uh, locusts, in other words, warning coloration, don't eat me kind of coloration. And we actually even see even bigger differences. We see a much smaller uh, brain and we say just a smaller overall cricket, or uh, overall locust in the solitary form. The gregarious forms are very big and they have very large, or much larger, at least relatively, brains. So anytime we see these very physical differences in the shape and structure and coloration of organisms um, when, when they're raised in two different environments, we call those morphs, right? So again, phenotypic uh, plasticity leads to different morphs that look different, have different entire body shapes, have different colors that just are physically different from one another uh, because of the environment. And again, that's what we call a morph. All right, so that's a little bit about how life history and life history traits are controlled, both by the genotype and by the environment. Um, so now we're going to delve a little bit more into some of the very basic life history traits. And a lot of the common ones are tied to reproduction because let's face it, there's kind of two things we do, we reproduce and we die. Um, and so a lot of the ways we classify organisms based on uh, their life history have to do with how they reproduce, the manner in which they reproduce. So one of the most basic is 
the dichotomy between asexual and sexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction is when we have binary fission, so where the parent organism divides itself into two, and those two are then the offspring. This is all prokaryotes, all bacteria, stuff like that. Um, it's actually very common in a lot of protists as well. And in fact, you know, we don't, we don't think about this much because we tend to think of ourselves and we don't do this, but there's actually some multicellular organisms that undergo asexual reproduction as well. And one example that you might have seen, even if you didn't realize it was asexual reproduction, so puppet stands actually consist of a pile of clones. All those different trees that you see, all those different tree trunks, they're actually identical to each other um, within a stand of poplar. They're genetically identical. And what happens is the parent tree sends off a shoot and then grows another little tree right next to it that is a carbon copy of itself. It's the same DNA. There was no mating. There was no sort of male and female gametes combining. That didn't happen. The, the parent tree just spit off a little piece. Um, this is actually quite common in plants. Any plant that you can take a cutting and then like grow that cutting, something like a grape, that is, um, that's going to be asexual reproduction because there was no mating, there was no mixing of DNA. You just took, you know, a few leaves from that plant and then started growing it into a new plant. So that's asexual. The opposite end, and this is humans, we have sexual reproduction. Uh, and this is where, I know you learned this stuff in high school, you have meiosis, you know, the, um, parent cell splits in half, you only get half of the chromosomes that the parent had, you get these processes of recombination where the parent's chromosomes actually swap uh, genes before they undergo meiosis, and then because you can't live as a half a cell, you have the process of fertilization where one parent's um, gamete or half of the one parent's chromosomes end up merging with the other parent's gamete which contains half of that parent's chromosomes and you get the full cell back. All right, so sexual reproduction occurs in most plants and animals. Um, even in plants that reproduce clonally, sometimes they also reproduce using sexual uh, um, reproduction. And um, it actually also happens in a lot of fungi and protists as well. And then within sexual reproduction, uh, remember I said sexual reproduction, we have that process of fertilization where we have um, gametes coming together from one parent and the other to make a whole. And what uh, we find is we can actually divide sexual reproduction as a life history trait into further classes. On the one hand, we have what's known as um, isogamy. And in that case, the gametes have equal size. Uh, so the sort of male and female, sometimes we don't call them male and female, sometimes we call them plus and minus those two different pieces from the two different parents um, are kind of at least similar in terms of how much material comes together. And we know that's not true for humans, right? Humans fall into the other category of anisogamy. <coughs> <coughs> Here you have gametes of unequal size. And so you might have the female having a much bigger gamete than the male. And of course, that's true of the female egg, which is uh, for humans, which is our gamete and the male sperm, which is again our gamete. So the sperm is very, very, very much smaller than the egg, and so that's anisogamy. Again, all of these different ways of reproducing fall within what we call an organism's life history. This is, these are life history traits associated with reproduction. <clears throat> so there's various different benefits to asexual versus sexual reproduction. If you reproduce asexually, you transmit 100% of your genetic material. <clears throat> when we reproduce, we only contribute half of the genetic material to our offspring because the other parent contributes the other half. And so that offspring isn't carrying all of our genes, right? Um, and so in order to sort of pass all of our genes along, we have to have a lot of different offspring. Um, another benefit that we don't think of as much with asexual reproduction, but is also important, is that you can maintain favorable gene combinations. So remember I talked about recombination where we swap different genes on different chromosomes, and even worse than that, we actually don't get all the chromosomes coming, you know, together as one piece, we, we might just get half. And so that makes it harder for two genes that work really well together to stay together in the, in the offspring. 
right? Because they may get mixed up by the process of recombination, or they may get mixed up if they're on two different chromosomes and you only get sort of the one gene um, that matches in, in the um, gamete and the wrong copy with the, you know, the allele that's not as good uh, in that particular combination, that may also come, and so you don't get to keep those things together. Sexual reproduction, though, <clears throat> has, a, has its benefits as well. The main one we think about is that it promotes genetic variations. So even though it causes this mix and match uh, where you, you can't keep good alleles together that might function well together, um, sort of, you know, allele 1 on gene A might function really well with allele 1 on gene B, but you can't keep those two alleles together. Um, sexual reproduction has that problem, but then at the same time, because of all that flip-flopping and switching and sort of shuffling, you get a lot of more genetic variation. And what that gives you is the capacity to evolve. Because if everything's the same, natural selection can't work on it. Natural selection works by saying, hey, this group of organisms is doing better than this group of organisms. If everybody's doing the same, there's no way you can have evolution. And so sexual reproduction really helps with evolution. Because of that, um, with sexual reproduction, we actually see an increase in fixation of beneficial alleles and a decrease in fixation of deleterious alleles. If you remember right, what fixation means is that's when that allele goes to 100% in the population. In other words, that's the only form of that gene that you see in the population. And so what you see with sexual reproducing organisms is that you have alleles becoming really, really prevalent in the population much more rapidly um, and much more often than you see with asexual. All right. So that's one way to think about reproduction. Uh, another dichotomy that's associated with reproduction has to do with when you reproduce. And here we divide organisms into what we call semiparous and interoparous. So semiparous organisms reproduce once in their lifetime. Uh, one of the classic examples is salmon. If any of you have ever been to Alaska um, in the summer, you'll have seen the salmon swimming upstream. And it's a little bit sad, but salmon, juvenile salmon swim out to the ocean, and they live their lives, and they do their thing, and then they decide, oh, it's time for me to reproduce. And they head back in, and they swim up the streams where they were born, and they put this huge effort into swimming up the streams, and um, just basically expend all of their resources as they go and push up against the current to reach the breeding grounds. And once they do, they lay their eggs, and then they die, and that's it. And because, you know, they put that huge effort in and die uh, in the, on the breeding grounds or, or near the breeding grounds, then that's, that's the chance they get. They can't reproduce again. They put all that effort in. They have nothing left. And so that's a semiparous life, uh, life history. Another good example is with periodic cicadas. These are um, cicadas that you might have seen in your lifetime uh, that emerge every... 13 to 17 years. So there's some populations that emerge at 13 years, there's some populations that emerge at 17 years. Uh, and so what happens is for the rest of their life, they're little grubby-like things that live under the ground. And so they live for 17 years under the ground, and then they come out for one amazing week or two where they all mate with each other and lay their eggs and, and then die. Um, and so again, you know, that, that two weeks where they breed, that's their one shot. That's the only time in the life span of these organisms that they're going to breed. It's a long lifespan, 13 or 17 years, but breeding only occurs in that last final two weeks. So that not really the case with humans. We have iteroparous uh, reproductive strategy, uh, and here we have multiple rounds of reproduction. And so that's why we have, you know, siblings that are different ages, because mom had the baby you know, when she was 40, or when she was 30, and then she had another baby when she was 34, or 35, or 32, but at a different point. And so, um, again, that's an iteroparous lifespan. Uh, it's also true of a lot of plants, long-lived plants at least, uh, perennial plants and trees that are uh, frequently perennial. And so if I think of something like an oak, an oak lives hundreds and hundreds of years, and every year it makes tons of acorns. And so again, that's breeding, that's reproducing every single year over hundreds of years. So that's iteroparous. A third dichotomy that's associated with reproduction is what we call R-selected species versus K-selected species. So R-selected species have high population growth rates. 
And in order to do that, they have high fecundity. They make tons of offspring. Um, and then these offspring reach sexual maturity early so that they can make even more offspring even faster. Um, not surprisingly, and we've talked about this a little bit before, when you make tons of offspring, you can't necessarily, you know, put all your effort into those offspring because there's just so many of them. And so you actually have low parental investments. Frequently, our selected species, there's no parental care at all. Uh, the parents just lay their eggs and run off, and that's it. But they lay many, many eggs in the hopes that something survives and that you have that high sort of population growth rate. So a good example is something like dandelions, right? And you might not think about parental care with dandelions because, you know, it's a plant. Um, but take a look at those dandelion seeds. The dandelion is not investing much in every single little offspring. There's, there's hardly anything there. They're small. they got a little bit of a feathery thing attached, but that's it, right? So that's low parental investment for a plant. If I look at case-selected species, it's sort of all the opposite. So they have a much slower population growth rate. You, you know, if I have two species, I don't come back three years later and have a million. Um, I come back three years later and I have maybe four or five of that individual uh, population. So case-selected species um, also have low fecundity. Each parent only has a couple of offspring, uh, or at least a couple of babies every year, um, maybe even just a couple of babies in their whole lifetime. They have delayed sexual maturity, so they're often much older when they start to breed in the first place. And they invest heavily in each offspring because they only have a few of them. They got to make sure that those offspring make it through, right? So there's a lot of parental care. Or again, if you're a plant, you may not think of parental care, um, but you know, you might think of putting more energy resources into every seed or every fruit. And so something like the palm tree, if I compare the seeds in a palm tree to the seeds in a dandelion, that palm tree's put a lot more investment in. There are sort of like these big fleshy fruits that go um, around the seed. And again, that sort of investment, but I can't, I can't make many, 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 many fruits because I just don't have the energy and so I only make a few, but I invest more in them. Um, so there's a couple of other uh, sort of tr life history traits that go along with R and K selection that aren't actually associated with reproduction at all. So R selected species tend to have small body size uh, versus K selected species that tend to be large. R selected species tend to be short lived and K selected species tend to be long lived. So I mean that has to do with survival and mortality which is another life history trait. Our selected species tend to be found in unstable environments. So these are environments that are only there for a short period of time and so you've got to capitalize on it really quick. You've got to make sure you get your sort of population growing in there while the growing is good because next year the growing may not be good. Um, and so again that's the R selected species. The opposite is the K selected species. They tend to do well or to be found in stable environments where that slower population growth rate isn't such a problem because, hey, you know, if it takes you 10 years to mature, it's okay because things are probably going to be the same 10 years from now as they are, as they are today. Um, because our selected species have this sort of lifespan, lifestyle that leads to them doing well in unstable environments, they, they are what we call early successional species. When we have Mount St. Helens blow up, they're the first things that get in there because they sort of grow rapidly um, in these low density uh, sort of conditions and they get to really high population sizes really fast. Not so with case selected species, they're what we call late successional species. You only see these after the forest has matured for a while um, since a disturbance. Um, our selected species do really well under conditions of low competition. You know, they're small, they don't have a lot of muscle behind them, they don't actually have a lot of much behind them, and so they're not really good at competing for space or nutrients or food or anything like that. Case selected species, on the other hand, you know, these are large, long-lived. They're, you know, really sort of the pushy species, and so they're very good at competition. Not so good at reproduction, but good at competition. Uh, and so the reason you might think, why R and K? We use our selected species uh, for these these popular these organisms that have high growth rates and sort of small body sizes, short-lived in unstable environments, because R is the symbol we use for the um, 
in what we call the intrinsic rate of increase of a population, how fast that population grows when there's only one or two individuals present there. We use K because that's the um, symbol we use for carrying capacity. These species do really well when the population is near its carrying capacity, when it's, there's almost no uh, more individuals that will fit there because the resources are kind of already being used up. Again, they're K uh, selected species because they do well at those high competition environments where resources are tight, but they're really good at competing for them. Now, that's idealized, and we might divide populations into R and K-selected species, but most species are intermediate. You know, it's hard to say, well, this species are R and this species are K. A lot of them have, you know, more R-selected traits, but they're kind of in between. Or more K-selected traits, but they're kind of in between. So R and K is one way to describe uh, sort of lifestyles or life histories of organisms, and that's applied to both plants and to animals. Um, one different way of classifying life history that's typically only used with um, plants is what we call Grimes Triangular Model. And these, these two different classification schemes are somewhat similar. They're, they're not completely different. Uh, so Grime had this idea that, you know, which plants do well in which environments can be determined by three different factors. It can be determined by how good they are at competition, how good they are at dealing with disturbance that destroys biomass. Maybe that's a fire, maybe that's a volcano, um, maybe that's a hurricane uh, or a storm. And, how, and then the final trait, uh, or the final sort of um, thing that plants have to deal with is stress. Maybe that's, uh, typically we think of that as water stress, something like a desert, something like that. So, um, again, Grimes divided plants into these three different classes, and he said, well, competitive plants are superior at getting access to light, nutrients or minerals, water, and space. They're the strong competitors, the good at edging everybody else out and making sure they get what they need. Uh, and so competitive plants are winners in low-stress environments where sort of things like water are not really that limiting, um, and they're good uh, in low disturbance environments. They're, they are good where you don't have constant fire and constant volcanoes and constant hurricanes. Um, and again, because they're sort of competitive, they high, they're very good at fighting for what they need, they are particularly good in high competition environments where there's lots of other plants that are fighting for sort of these limited resources. And again, water is a little bit tricky because that might be a limited resource if there's lots of plants, but in a desert, it's just a stressor in general. Even if there's no other plants around, finding water can be difficult. So again, you might get a little confused there, but um, competitive plants are good at finding uh, sort of these limited resources that can include water when they're limited because there's so many other things fighting for them. There's so many other plants around stealing. All right. Uh, so uh, good examples of competitive plants are things like... Um, uh, birch, uh, things like those kinds of trees. All right, then he had uh, these next group that he called ruderals. And ruderals are plants with short lifespans, rapid growth rates, um, and heavy investment in seed production. Not necessarily in each individual seed, but in making tons of seeds. So, you know, maybe the plants aren't growing too big, but they're making tons of babies. Um, and so, again, that's sort of like an R-selected lifestyle. Um, these also tend to be organisms that make seeds that survive, and they exploit disturbed habitats. They're found in areas that are subject to constant destruction of biomass, constant fires, constant storms that tear things down, um, constant volcanoes, uh, even something like mowing the lawn. They're good at dealing with that kind of disturbance. Uh, in your backyard. And so ruderal plants do really well. They're the winners in environments where there's low stress, so, you know, where water or, or heat or things like that are not sort of pushing on them. Um, they do well in environments with low competition. Uh, so, you know, they're not so good at dealing with crowded conditions and lots of other plants around. What they are really good at de dealing with are these environments that are constantly destroyed, where, you know, the the individual plants are constantly being um, ruined through different forces, uh, they're good at capitalizing on those environments. 
So again, these are things like dandelions. We saw those were our selected species. They're also rules. Again, those are very similar classification schemes. Um, and uh, actually, a lot of the pest species that get into your backyards, because you are constantly mowing your backyard and that's a disturbance, those tend to be ruderals. Um, then the final type of plant he called stress-tolerant plants. And these have slow growth rates, which is kind of similar to K uh, selected species. They tend to have evergreen foliage. They use water at slower rates, and they use nutrients at slower rates, and that makes them sort of good in these nutrient-poor, water-poor, stressful environments. Um, and again, these environments are poor not necessarily because there's so many other plants competing for them, but just because those things like water are rare in those environments in the first place. Um, they uh, have low levels of herbivory, and they tend to exploit temporarily favorable habitats. And so these stress-tolerant plants are the winners in environments where you have very low disturbance, not a lot of fires, not a lot of um, storms, not a lot of volcanoes, nothing like that, not a lot of cutting them down, doing the forestry or mowing the lawn. Uh, stress-tolerant plants also tend to do well in low competition environments. When you start crowding them out, they start to not do so well. Where they do do well is in those high-stress environments. That's the one sort of factor that they're good at dealing with. Um, and so a good example is cacti. Again, the stress there is sort of the desert conditions. Not so much crowding and fighting and competition, and not so much uh, disturbance. And then there were a lot of intermediate strategies where you'd have plants that were good at competition and stress, but not, that were not ruderals, that were sort of not good at disturbance. Uh, plants that were good at disturbance and stress, but they were not strong competitors, and plants that are good at um, dealing with disturbance and stress, but aren't so good at, at competition. And so you have all the different combinations, and then you have sort of the plants that are kind of good at everything. All right. So one interesting fact about life history traits is that they're often correlated. Um, and so, for example, size traits might be correlated such that the amount of growth in roots under a tree is about the same as the amount of growth in roots above a tree. Uh, so we don't have sort of tiny tree crowns with massive root systems or tiny root systems with massive tree crowns. We see that, you know, in general, trees that have massive crowns tend to have massive roots. Same kind of thing with... Um, uh, time, for instance. So age at maturity is often correlated with lifespan. <clears throat> if I am going to have a long lifespan, live to be 100, maybe I don't start to reproduce until I'm 50. Whereas if I'm going to live to be 2, I tend to start reproducing when I'm, you know, 6 months or a year old. Because life history traits are correlated, uh, and we can see that again in, in this, this plot with above ground biomass and below ground biomass, they kind of make a line, right? And so we can think about those lines, and we can think about the slopes of those lines, and that gives us what's known as a dimensionless ratio. So dimensionless ratios are ratios in which the units in the numerator and the denominator are the same. That's really the only way you can compare. And uh, it, it's sort of the, it allows you to compare um, across different organisms. So I don't want to compare the um, <clears throat> root system of a really big tree to the root system of a really small tree, maybe. What I want to compare is how much bigger that root system is than the crown in a big tree and a small tree. Uh, and so, again, what you would do is, if I'm looking at biomass, I might compare above ground and below ground, and that's the same units, right? That's both in um, kilograms. If I'm looking at age at maturity versus age at lifespan, again, those are the same units, and so I can just divide those two to get a dimensionless ratio, and then compare that dimensionless ratio across different species to see if they're really that different when you account for sort of these uh, correlated factors. All right. <clears throat> so, <coughs> one thing that really governs life histories is the idea of constraints. And that brings up this sort of connected idea of allocation. And so allocation is the relative amount of energy or resources that an organism devotes to different functions. And we talked about this a little bit in the first class. If I put all my money towards buying beer, then I have less to put towards buying textbooks. If I put money towards buying textbooks, I have less to spend on beer. 
And so this is the idea of allocation. How do different organisms use their limited energy resources um, and do they use them for, say, vegetative growth or do they use them to make seeds for reproduction? <clears throat> and so again, because there are these constraints, what we end up with is trade-offs. And you could have a survival versus reproduction trade-off where, you know, the, the your choice is to either put energy towards living through the winter or your choice is to have offspring before the winter and that might make you less likely to survive yourself because your fat stores have already been used up in having the baby. Uh, another life history trade-off is growth versus reproduction, uh, current reproduction versus future reproduction, quality versus quantity of offspring, number versus size of offspring, and um, again, the problem is we'd love to have all of these. We'd love to have, you know, really great odds of survival, but also have many children. We'd love to have lots of vegetative growth, but also make lots of seeds. We'd love to have lots of babies now, and then also lots of babies to later. Um, but the problem is that you can't do that. There's constraints. And so maximizing one life history trait often comes at a cost to the other. In more detail, survival versus reproduction. And this is something that was first observed by a scientist named Rickliffs where he was looking at the fecundity versus the survivorship of adult birds. And actually what we find is that this is universally true across different bird species, um, across birds in different locations, in the north versus in the south. Um, it's, it's really something that, that they find across a lot of different bird species where the clutch size or the number of eggs that the adult bird lays um, is related to the probability that that adult bird will survive through to the next year. And so if they lay tons of eggs, say six eggs, they've only got a 25% chance of surviving through to the next year. Whereas if they only lay two eggs, maybe they've got a 90% chance of surviving. Um, and again, they found this same result across many, many, many different studies, um, many in birds, but also in other organisms. So again, here's a comparison between southern hemisphere birds, and then we have a comparison of different bird species in Arizona and Argentina. Another trade-off is growth versus reproduction. And so the more resources that are devoted to growing, the less they're available for making babies. And again, this is a trend that we see across a large number of mammals where fertility rates tend to decrease with increasing body size. And so you can see humans are quite large, but they don't tend to have a lot of babies. Um, if I look at other primates, <coughs> I tend to have maybe smaller body sizes. You think of most little monkeys, they're not too big, but they do have more babies in their entire lifespan and also per year. Um, and then what you see in the dark colors are um, just uh, primates. What you see in the white spots, that's all mammals. And again, some mammals are actually much bigger than humans and, and have uh, less, less offspring. Some mammals are much, much smaller than humans, and tend, those ones tend to have many, many more offspring than humans do. So current versus future reproduction. This is the idea that if I make many flowers in one year, say 2017, the plant that has three flowers may have one flower the next year, whereas the plant that only had one flower in 2017 may have three flowers in 2018. And so again, this has been studied looking at exactly what we saw there, where the number of blooms you have on a particular plant in year one is negatively correlated with the number of blooms that you have on that same plant a year later. Quality versus quantity. Um, this is a, an example again in humans, where larger human offspring are associated with lower female fertility rates. So if I have big babies, I don't tend to have as many babies. And we see this across uh, different populations. This is also um, uh, an example of a number versus size of, of offspring. So, you know, quality is often related to size. Bigger offspring do better because they're just more robust, they're better at competing, all these sorts of things. So bigger offspring are uh, quality as well, and so often a number versus size trade-off comes down to a quality versus quantity trade-off as well. Um, 
One interesting thing is that we often have trade-offs across life stages. So different uh, morphology or different shapes uh, and different behaviors can be adaptive at different points in your life, right? Uh, and so we can see this something like with trees, small size has disadvantages because it might make you vulnerable to predation, it might make you a poor competitor for food, it might mean you have very limited um, storage capacity to save up for rough times, uh, and that's why being small is bad. But being small can be good in that if you're a seed, maybe that helps you with dispersal or the movement of the organism. Um, it can also be suited to dormancy. Uh, big things like humans rarely go dormant. Little things like seeds or spores are very good at going dormant um, just because it's easier to sort of develop dormancy in, in something that size. And so when we have these different trade-offs um, across life stages, you know, am I at a life stage where I want to disperse or am I at a life stage where I want to fight off competitors and get food? Uh, what we frequently see is variation in the trait across the lifespan. And so think about a tree. It's really, really big because when it's an adult tree, it wants to compete for food and it doesn't want to be eaten by herbivores. And it wants to be able to store a whole pile of resources for the winter, say. But then if I think about something like a tree's um, reproductive gametes or its seeds, they tend to be very small. These pine trees put out pollen that's tiny, tiny, tiny because being small is helpful at that stage of the life where you will try to disperse because you're a seed, because you're a new offspring. So that's one example where we have variation in a life uh, history trait driven by what's advantage, advantageous at different points in the life cycle. Um, this is actually quite common. Uh, we, we have uh, that sort of same property in insects, for instance. Something like caddisflies. Caddisflies are very common in Lake Hartwell. You might see some around this time of year. <coughs> but what you actually see is that we have adults that feed um, primarily on plant juices, nectar and plant juices, and that's beneficial to them. And then we have larvae that live in the water and actually feed on other aquatic uh, insects. So they're actually sort of carnivores. Um, and again, these two different traits are adaptive at the different stages in, in their life. Um, sort of what they eat when is, is uh, adaptive depending on where they are and what stage of life they're at. Um, these trade-offs, you, you can actually, these trade-offs can actually drive changes in morphology or behavior or habitat use over the course of a lifespan. And when this happens, when you have sort of organisms using one life history strategy when they're in one stage of life and a different life history strategy in a different stage of life, say they're eating leaves when they're a baby but they're eating nectar when they're an adult, we call this a niche shift. And a niche shift is a size or age specific change in an organism's ecological function or habitat. Sort of the life history trait that it uses changes dramatically um, as a function of size or age. Ultimately, this leads to what we call a complex life cycle. And this is a life cycle with at least two distinct stages that differ in their habitat, physiology, or morphology. So a classic example that we all know from the Hungry Caterpillar book is the case of um, uh, holometabolous insects. So they start as an egg, and then they become a caterpillar. And then the caterpillar turns into a cocoon, and the cocoon turns into an adult butterfly. So caterpillars tend to eat leaves or some kind of um, vegetative surface, and um, butterflies again eat nectar. We see actually see this in a lot of diff oh, all ho different holometabolous insects, things like beetles, where we have grubs that are eating plant roots, and then we have the beetle emerge and it can eat something totally different. Same with caddisflies. Um, so I've listed a lot of insects. Um, I haven't listed a lot of vertebrates, and that's because most, not all, most vertebrates have simple life cycles. And this is the exact opposite. That's where they're sort of the same habitat, the same physiology, and the same morphology over their entire life. Complex life cycles are common, however, in some fish, uh, most amphibians, and marine invertebrates, and many insects. With complex life cycles, we have what's known as metamorphosis, and this is an abrupt transition in form from larva to juvenile. And um, because of this 
change in form, this is where you get that habitat shift, and that's where you get what we call the nip shift. And so metamorphosis occurs in the Hungry Caterpillar book as the caterpillar goes from being a caterpillar to a cocoon to a butterfly. Interestingly enough, 25 of 33 phyla have some complex life cycles. Uh, not all the species in there necessarily in, in those phyla have complex life cycles, but some of them do. Uh, there are the rest of the phyla, there's no known organism within that phyla <clears throat> that has a complex life cycle. 80% um, of all species, interestingly enough, undergo metamorphosis. <clears throat> so this is a very successful strategy uh, for dealing with different requirements at different life stages. One example of a very complex life cycle uh, is alternation of generation. So this is even more complex than the hungry caterpillar where one organism lived as a caterpillar and then turned into a butterfly. In this case we have different generations. The mom lives a different way than the baby and the baby then lives a different way than the mom. <clears throat> and so in this case we have one generation that's uh, uh, multicellular diploid sporophyte, uh, and then we have a second generation that is a multicellular haploid gametophyte. Uh, and you can see that the form, this particular plant, the forms of the spor sporophyte, the way they look, is very different from the way the gametophyte plant grows. Um, and again, that is just an, one more example of complex life cycles. Not necessarily changing from a larval to an adult form, it can be this changing from a uh, haploid to a diploid form from one generation to another. Very different example, but still a complex life cycle. Another complex life cycle is sequential hermaphroditism. Uh, and this is a case where over their lifespan, organisms change sex. Uh, so one of the examples that most people are familiar with is the clownfish. In the clownfish, there's a dominant female and there's a sort of male. And the the biggest male in the group breeds with the female. And then there's all these sort of smaller juvenile male that don't breed. When the female dies, the large previously breeding male turns into a female. And now she breeds as a female and the next sort of juvenile male takes the place and becomes the dominant male, or, or the, it's actually called a non-dominant male, but the breeding male. And that male then breeds with that new female that used to be a male. Again, very strange things going on <laughs> across life stages, and that's an example of a complex life cycle. There's a transition from one form to another during the life. It doesn't have to be a gain from larva to, to adult. We think of that frequently with things like butterflies. It can be any kind of change from one sex to another sex, um, from uh, a gametophyte uh, to a sporophyte, anything like that. Now, complex life cycles evolve in response to selective pressures. And, you know, we can take a look at a typical ancestral salamander life cycle where we have eggs, gilled larvae, and adults that are terrestrial. And that's sort of the way, historically, way back in time, salamanders were. But, a lot of salamanders have changed this life cycle because there were different pressures. Maybe there was no water to have a gilled juvenile stage in, and so what do you do? You lose the gilled uh, aquatic stage, and that allows you to live in environments where finding water for that larval stage is almost impossible. And so if you drop that out, you go straight from the egg to the terrestrial adult, and to do that, the um, the egg actually develops into a juvenile prior to hatching and then you turn into the adult directly. This is known as direct development so this is where you have development from the egg to the juvenile occurring in the egg prior to hatching and so there's no free living larval stage. And in fact with um, I believe it's plethodon I was out in the woods all weekend and we saw a lot of these these uh, plethodon salamanders that do that and they're a primarily terrestrial salamander where you know they're living up at high elevations where maybe they can't find water and so they just directly develop into adults from eggs. Uh, another possibility is where you know maybe getting out on land is kind of dangerous because there's a lot of predators searching for you out there and so then you might think well 
how do I get away with this? Well, I'm going to change my life cycle. I'm going to evolve so that I have no terrestrial stage, right? Then I don't have to worry about predators on land because I'm just living in the water. Uh, and so there are actually salamanders that have done this too, and this is called the morph. So this is where we have a delay or even a complete loss of some developmental event related to sexual maturation. Uh, and a good example of pedomorphic salamanders are the sirens. Uh, you have sirens, you've probably never seen them because they're sort of only in the water. Uh, but those of you who fish might have, might have come across them. But they're big, big, big salamanders that have gills uh, all the way through to when they breed. Uh, and so they never come out of the water. And again, that's pedomorphism. And there's actually a new species of siren that was discovered in Alabama, I think last year or the year before, 2018 or so. All right. Now, the interesting thing about salamanders is that they've actually switched from the ancestral state, which was biphasic, having a terrestrial adult stage as well as a, a um, aquatic larval stage. They've actually switched to direct development and pedomorphic uh, forms or, or life cycles multiple times. And so if I look at this uh, evolutionary tree, uh, what you can see is that the yellow salamanders have direct development, the blue salamanders are pedomorphic, uh, so again, they never develop into adults, and then the red salamanders have that traditional life cycle where I have the aquatic juveniles and the terrestrial adults. And you can see that um, it's not that I have all my yellows evolved together or all my blues evolved together or all my reds evolved together. I actually have sort of interspersed within the different groups. Now, the one thing I want to make clear is that regardless of whether life histories are complex or simple, regardless of whether you're looking at plants or animals and the life history traits that are associated with those, regardless of whether you're looking at plants that are ruderals, which is disturbance tolerance or stress tolerance, regardless, 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 an important message, probably the most important message of this lecture is that life histories are selected for and evolved to maximize organism fitness in their particular environment, to maximize how well an organism does in the environment. I'm going to drop a terrestrial stage if that's not helping me to survive and produce offspring. I'm going to drop an aquatic stage, I'm going to drop the aquatic larval, I'm going to develop a life history uh, or a life history strategy, a life cycle that um, doesn't have that if that's not helping me to do better at survival and reproduction. All right. And so I think, you know, we see good examples of how evolution occurs and how evolution lives for different um, life histories in what's known as the lat clutch size. So the lat clutch size is the maximum number of offspring that a parent can successfully raise to maturity. And this was studied in birds. What they found is that, more, uh, that birds tend to lay more eggs at higher latitudes. And so, you know, down here in the south, maybe my birds are only laying one egg in their nest, Whereas up here in the north, in Alaska, in northern Canada, the same bird might be laying three eggs in their nest. And the reason that uh, this happens is that birds in the north can actually for a lot longer. It's really daylight in the spring for a lot longer. And there's more fish and food availability, and so that's why they can lay more eggs. And so again, what we see is that the selection pressure has driven birds in the north to have different life histories than birds in the south, to have different numbers of offspring, which remember early on I said was one way that we characterize life histories. That was one life history trait. And so again, the longer daylight allows them to collect food for longer, and that allows them to have larger eggs. Evolution uh, selects for organisms, and that selection determines their life history traits, their life history, their life history strategies, and their life cycles. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to email me at sbuick at clemson.edu and bye.